OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. I'm delighted to say we have with us now Jonathan Wilson, a football writer with The Guardian, who uh, just this week was crowned Football Writer of the Year for the third time at the FSA Awards. Jonathan, first off, congratulations. Well done. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. You uh, you look great in your tuxedo alongside Miguel Delaney, and um, he, he put up a good show of being supportive of you in your Arab <laughs> success. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was it was very nice. We were sitting together at the same table, and uh, I'd have been delighted had he won, and just as delighted as he was that I won. Uh, we've just asked a, a good question of Samuel Luckhurst. It's not my question, so I can say it was a good question. Uh, <laughs> what does success look like for Ralph Ranick over the next four and a half, five months? What does he have to do to make everybody think that was a good idea? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is a good question because I, I think the answer is is really not obvious or not easy. I, I suppose in very simple terms, they. You know they need to finish fourth. They need to to, to be in the Champions League next season. Um, so they're what five points off at the minute. I don't think you look at those teams that they're competing with and, and think that any of them are significantly better than United. If you look at West Ham or Arsenal or, or Wolves, um, you think well it's entirely possible given this United squad that they they could overhaul them. But actually, I think his job is more in the longer term. I think it's the consultancy that will determine whether this is success or not. And that's where Ragnick has been successful in the past, that um, yeah, in terms of trophy seats, well, he's a little bit like Marcelo Bielsa, that he, he hasn't got this great list of honours. I mean, he, he got Hanover promoted, he, he won the cup with Schalke, and that's pretty much it, which for a 63-year-old doesn't sound like a great body of work. But where he's been incredibly influential and incredibly successful is in... in essentially planting the seed of pressing in German football. So in the late 80s, when he was really developing this idea of pressing, you know, he famously, February 1983, he's player coach of, of this sixth-tier West German side, Victoria Backnang. They play a friendly against Valery Lobanovsky's Dynamo Kiev, and he can't believe what's going on to the point that when the ball goes out of play for throw-in in the first half, he stops and counts how many players Dynamo have because he can't quite believe they've only got 11. And that was his sort of, you know, scales from the eyes moment, his Damascene moment of, you know, pressing can do something really, really exciting. And that wasn't part of German football at all at that point. But he he sort of begins that process of, of instilling pressing. And even late 90s, you know, there's the famous TV appearance where he tries to explain a back four, he tries to explain zonal marking. And he's sort of laughed out of town as this nerd who doesn't really connect with, with the values of German football, which at the time were man-to-man -man marking, physical courage, leadership. But time has proved him right. And it, it, it took for sort of the next generation, people like Jurgen Klopp, to really take that into the mainstream. Uh, but he's been there in the background all the time and um, very directly controlling things, particularly at Leipzig, where he was head of football development for, for the whole Red Bull group of clubs. So he was, he was coach of Red Bull twice very briefly, which I guess is the thing that's analogous to what's going to happen at United where he, he essentially kept the seat warm until uh, you know, he could bring in a new candidate in his image. And that's what slightly concerns me with this word consultancy, because I don't quite know what the parameters of that are going to be. And I don't know why, if you're United and you want Rangnick to, to, to rebuild your club in his image, in the way that he's built RB Leipzig, why would you not make him director of football? Now, I know they, they appointed John Murta in, in March. Murta yeah, he came from Everton. Uh, is somebody who, who doesn't have a huge public profile. It's not entirely clear what he what he's done so far. Uh, was there no way that Ragnar could have had a much more formal role? Now, maybe consultant means he will be running everything. I think there's a danger consultant means he, he gets slightly pushed to the side. It's really going it, to... That will be the most uh, fundamentally interesting question that gets answered here. And, and we just had Samuel Luckers on. He was saying that, um, you know, he covers Manchester United for the Manchester Evening News. He can't really tell what the difference in the role between Darren Fletcher and Murta is, except that recently Fletcher has been involved on a day-to-day -day basis putting on his his boots. And that's not just a post-Solskjaer sacking thing, that actually he'd been watching matches alongside Richard Arnold, he'd been watching matches in the press box, he'd been eyes and ears on match day, which is not really what you would have expected a football director or a technical director to do. So maybe there is room for a third person in that to kind of guide the two slightly less experienced men about how you build a club in the in the image of Red Bull? Is there is there a way that they can all make that relationship work? Well, I, th I think there is a way, um, but I, I, it just makes me uneasy when roles are not clearly defined. I think we saw that, uh, for instance, at Arsenal in the, in the post-Venger era when they, you know, they brought in Nisland Tat. 
and, and you had even Gazidis, and you had these th the three figures there uh, who nobody seemed quite to know what each of them were doing. They ended up all sort of falling out with each other, and they've all left the club now. Yeah. So, like that great triumvirate that they put in place just didn't work. So, I, I, that, that's it's just that word consultant makes me very nervous. I, I, I wish it was clearer what that is. But I mean, I, I th the, the point you make about experience, I think, is absolutely a key one. That Michael Carrick and, and um, Darren Fletcher clearly both um, were yeah, extremely good midfielders. I, I, I'm sure they know what they're doing. I think we've seen actually some steal from Carrick in the last week that, that maybe we we didn't know that he had. Um, but they're they're really learning their trade. So uh, again, I don't know what influence Murtis had directly, and he he is more experienced. But Rangnick at 63 is extremely experienced and, and that I think is a very useful virtue for them to add. Has, has he ever experienced the dressing room quite like this though? No, probably not and and the truth is that when he was at Chalka, which is the highest profile job he's had, he really didn't enjoy it. Uh, he was head coach there and you might remember he was in charge of Schalke when they lost to United in that Champions League uh, it was semi-final was it? It was a quarter-final, semi-final I think. Um, but he, he really didn't like the pressure of that, he didn't like the scrutiny, he didn't like being front and centre all the time. So I, I, I think it makes sense that he's taken the job on an interim basis. I, I don't think he would want it longer term. I think he doesn't enjoy that. He he likes being the guy in the background, um, so he can have his influence. You know, he can run things his way, but without having to face the media, without having to do that, uh, the, the very front facing role that, that that a modern coach has to has to do. But this, this is a difficult dressing room. You're right. Um, yeah, I'm sure he's dealt with big personalities before, but I'm not sure there's any bigger personality in modern football than, than Ronaldo. And that is a clear point of conflict because Ronaldo's football and Rangnick's football do not seem in any way congruent. non simpatico it seems. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the uh, the quote from Maurizio Sarri after his time at Juventus about Ronaldo being actually like a multinational organisation that you're managing the whole time, I, I think that everybody goes, oh, no one player is bigger than the club. But at the moment, Cristiano Ronaldo's right there with Manchester United. His his influence and interests are hugely important. And that's kind of why they signed him in the first place. So, like, is one of the business directives, one of the uh, key business priorities to make sure that Ronaldo is front and centre and there's a lot of talk about him and the social is high and everybody gets their little bit of Ronaldo pie? Like, difficult for Ranier yeah. to come in and say, oh, I'm not playing him. Yeah, it is. I mean, you're quite right. It's not just a tactical issue. It's it's um, you know, it's, an, it's an ego issue, uh, and uh, uh, even Real Madrid by the end became. I'm saying even Real Madrid as though Real Madrid and, and Manchester United are not sort of comparable clubs. But you saw at Real Madrid that they become FC Ronaldo by the end, and Ronaldo's needs and Ronaldo's whims become the the the, the, the dominant force. And, and whatever a coach does with Ronaldo. Whether he plays him, whether he asks him to play wide, whether he uses him from a bench, if he rests him for a little while, if he drops him, all of those are huge decisions, and 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 they you know they become uh, massively hyped up. And if Rangnick's somebody who doesn't like that that public confrontation and publicly discussing things, that's a, that's a huge problem straight away. Um, and you, I think the relationship between Ronaldo and Zidane have become fractured at the end at Real Madrid, and, and you know both of them end up leaving the club. But then at Juve, he's burned through three coaches. Yeah, he burned through Allegri, whose record was was excellent. Uh, Sarri, I mean, again, Ronaldo's football and Sarri's football, uh, to use your word, are, are not simpatico. Uh, and then Pirlo, who obviously is you know, his first season in as a manager, found it very hard to deal with him. But yeah, Pirlo's final game, what does he do? He drops Ronaldo because by his final game, when he knows he's leaving, he you know he he. Um, he feels empowered to do that, but I suspect that suggests that it's something he'd wanted to do much earlier yeah. and hadn't felt able to. And yeah, Michael Carrick dropping him, if it was Carrick, um, it's it's easier for Carrick to do it because he knew that was his last game, or as it turns out, penultimate game, but with Ragnar coming in at the weekend. Jonathan, from a tactical point of view, is there any way of a pressing system succeeding with Ronaldo in the team? Um, I would say no. Um, and it's, I think it's interesting, Rangnick is, is on record as saying, and this is when he was at Leipzig six years ago, saying he wouldn't sign Ronaldo. However, having said that, um, I think you can still use him. Uh, I just think you can't use him in big games. If you play Ronaldo against Norwich, for instance, he, he will score goals. Of course he'll score goals. And if you're not particularly worried by 
by the way Norwich play it from the back. And yeah, I'm using Norwich as, as, as an example, but yeah, weaker clubs, lower half Premier League clubs, then, then he is still a valuable weapon because he is still a great goal scorer. Equally, 20 minutes to go, you're 1 0 down, you're desperate for a goal. Well, Ronaldo's a great figure to, to chuck off a bench. And, you know, he, he can score all kinds of different goals. He can do something brilliant himself. He can, yeah, you can stick the ball in the box, he can win the header. You know, the ball might drop to him and lash in a volley. So he, he's still a powerful weapon to have. And that, I assume, is why City thought he might be a useful player to sign. I mean, I'm assuming here that City did genuinely want to sign him and that wasn't some sort of well, yeah. I was just uh, say. false flag operation to kind of <laughs> to lure Manchester United into making this terrible mistake. Isn't that one of the great sliding doors moments in football history? What would Guardiola have done with Ronaldo right now in the like late stage Ronaldo? That would have been amazing to watch. It really would have been, yeah. Because it was one of those things when I first said, I'm like, that can't be true. Surely that's not true. And you're desperately trying to sort of, um, you know, all these things I thought I understood about football. I think, God, have I got this all wrong? And, and <laughs> I still don't know. I'd love to see how that functioned. I suspect it would have been a bit like the uh, Zatno Ibrahimovic uh, Guardiola link up at Barcelona, where it just didn't really work out and, and they ended up falling out quite badly. But I'd still like to see it. Yeah. I do feel like that was somehow a city state decision as opposed to a football Guardiola decision and that he would have just, um, Graham Hunter made the point, he's constantly talking about being an employee at the club and he just does what he's told and maybe you've got to make Ronaldo work because it's going to help us to, and uh, you know, that's why we got involved in football, kids, <laughs> so that you would forget about all the other things that are going on in the world. Um, in terms of how you expect Ranić's side to play football, in this next four month, five months, what will they actually do? How how will they line out? What what will the formation be? Do you think is it back to that four and the blocks of two, or will he look at the playing stock and think he can do something different? Um, I'd be surprised if it's not back four. I think it'll be a back four. Uh, I, I I assume looking at the squad, looking at how he's played before, it'll probably be a four two three one. I, I know that his final season at Leipzig, he tended to play two up front. They tend to be more of a four four two. Uh, but in 2015-16, it was more of a 4-2-3-1. And I think you but you need to get Bruno Fernandes into the team. And I, I know the last month or so, he's not been in great form. But he is their best creative player. So I, I actually, in terms of um, formation, it's not going to be that different to what we've seen already. That The back four, two of the holders, so probably in most games, McTominay and, and Fred, Bruno Fernandes in front of them. Then a centre-forward who... I think might be Cavani more often than it has been, and probably Ronaldo at times, and perhaps Greenwood or, or Rashford, depending. Um, then yeah, I, I think I think we'll see a lot more from Sancho. I think this is a really good good news for Sancho. Um, you know, he he came his success at Dortmund came in a very very structured system under Lucien Favre. That he was very you know, the way he'd been sort of brought up playing football was. Okay, if this player moves here, then I move here, and if I move here, I know he's moving there, and I know that this fullback is coming up on the outside all the time, and it, you know he he it was very very regimented, and he clearly thrived in that environment. Then suddenly he's chucked in at Manchester United, where under Solskjaer, I don't think there was any of that kind of chaos. instruction. Yeah, it was a it was a go and improvise on on this. Um, so Rangnick will impose that structure. Uh, and so I, th I think we'll see Sancho, who's been getting better anyway, to be fair. You know, the last couple of games have been his best two games at the club. I think Sancho will become a much more central central figure. Um, but but then the, yeah, the big issue is, I guess, is, is it Ronaldo? Um, and how does Ronaldo cope with not not just the, the requirement to press, not just the requirement to do defensive running, but also... Uh, the sense he can't, from an attacking point of view, he can't just do what he wants. He's got to fit in with these attacking structures. And those attacking structures, I think, in the last decade, have become what differentiate the, the great coaches from the very good coaches. So Klopp, Guardiola, Tuchel, they are very, very good at putting together these coherent attacking structures. Well, yes, there, there are improvisations there, but they're improvisations on a theme that has been laid down. And then you have the slightly older-fashioned view of things, your Mourinho's, your Solskjaer's, where it is, I will create the right mindset for you to make the right decisions, but I'm not going to pre-program it. What about the challenge Klopp raised of not having time between games? You know, that he may have been used to having a bit more time, that the Premier League comes at you so fast, so thick and fast when you're competing on two fronts. How difficult will that be for him? Yeah, I think it's a major issue. I think it's a problem for any 
pressing coach taking over in the middle of a season. But this is the worst possible time because you haven't even got um, you know, League Cup games to, to, to give you a bit of a break. You know, this or an is international the most break. They could have or international breaks, ago. yeah. yeah. Um, but this is the most relentless part of English season. And, and okay, there is the break coming up in January, plus there's um, you know, the early rounds of the Cup where he, you know, he may be play a week inside and you know he can he can do more of the work he needs to do with, with his first team and Klopp of course experiences you know Klopp came in was was late autumn and there was that I mean that that season Liverpool had that sort of initial surge under Klopp where his personality and his charisma and he, you know the 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 Brendan Rodgers era had, it had clearly gone slightly off kilter uh, and just the sort of sense of relief of as a new guy he knows what he's doing but after that first sort of six weeks two months Liverpool ended that season pretty badly um, because he, you know, he just didn't have time to put those structures in place. I think it's really interesting Klopp mentions that because he, he's he's gone through it. So the fact that yeah, you know, there's, there's a, a mid midweek round of games this week. There's a game at the weekend. There's another midweek round of games before Christmas. Then you've got the, the congestion of the, of the Christmas fixture list. The next sort of five or six games come in, you know, what well, four weeks, and that is absolutely relentless and so incredibly difficult. You have got maybe one proper training session between each game to to try and get very very different ideas across. So yeah, I think think that is a is a big difficulty. Jonathan, the back four that you talk about is there room in that back four for uh, by and uh, are, are, you know th- those fringe players who might actually improve quickly under a new manager because they've had no confidence and they haven't given any love who might actually turn out to be perfect for a style where. I, I, I don't know enough, but I suspect he plays quite a high line. If you're pressing mm, and you're trying yeah, yeah. to get the ball back in the first two and a half seconds, then your defenders need to push up to make sure it feels like you've got 13 players in the field instead of 11. Is is someone like Bay more suited to that than Harry Maguire, who's a bit slower? Yeah, I mean, I, in, in terms of physical characteristics, I'd, I'd say he is. And I think that's an issue of, with uh, Varane as well, that I think there have been times when Varane has looked uncomfortable in a high press for, for all his other qualities as, as a defender. And that, that you know that's and that's the general problem of planning at United that there's been no no sporting director no no director of football laying down the model conditioning the sort of players you, you sign. So I I, I if, you know if I were an opposing manager playing against Maguire and Varane playing high, I I would see that as a as a potential weakness. Bay he's got the great pace. Um, I don't, you know, Bay's one of those players I, I don't just don't quite understand that. Uh, I, I sort of became aware of, aware of him for the first time at the Cup of Nations in 2015 when Cote d'Ivoire won the tournament. And he, he was brilliant in that tournament. Uh, they, 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 they played a back three. Colo Turo was sweeping. and It was him and uh, Wilfried Cannon. And the three of them were were, were all excellent. Uh, and obviously I knew about Colo Turo, but the other two I sort of thought, yeah, they, they could both really kick on and do something uh, hugely impressive. And and Bai, I think Bai was the better of the two just because he's quicker. Uh, but his career at United, there's been some good games, there's been quite a lot of bad games, quite a lot of mistakes. And I don't know if that's just something in him that, that um, he doesn't have that capacity to concentrate that you, that you have to as, as a, as a centre-back, or whether it's to do with the fact he's been chopped and changed so much, he's never really had a consistent partner, he's never really played regularly, and maybe his confidence has been affected. And certainly, you know, I think the own goal against City, you know, if, 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 when you're suddenly dropped into a game like that, uh, coming pretty quickly after you know, he'd been left out at Leicester, which was, was a bewildering decision because Maguire clearly wasn't fit in that mm. game. Uh, yeah, you think of the the first Leicester goal in that game; it's a poor pass out from De Gea, and Maguire just can't push off that injured calf to get to the the, the, the weak pass quickly enough. And you, you were sort of watching that thinking they'd given by a, what was it a three year contract in the summer? If he if they had no faith in him, why not just let him go? But if you've given him a three year contract. Why are you not playing him in a game when the main centre back clearly isn't fit? Um, and so, I, you know, I, I have sympathy with him because I, I can see why in that City game suddenly there's all this chaos going on. And he's been thrust in there, but it's been made pretty apparent to him that, that, that the manager doesn't really believe in him. So, so that's a very long-winded way of getting around to yes, Bai is quick, and that was even more natural fit. Whether he's actually good enough, I'm not sure. Okay, we, we will wait and see. On balance, it sounds like you're more positive than negative, but there's definitely some caveats. Oh, I think it's the, the most exciting appointment they've made since Ferguson. Um, I, 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 the, the, the caveats, I, I, well, I, I guess there's two caveats. The first is we shouldn't really judge anything on what happens between now and the end of the season. Uh, you know, if, if, they get, if they finish fourth 
or you know they, they have a, a run in the FA Cup or, or you know the, the Champions League, then brilliant, that's a bonus. But actually it's about getting the, the structures in place, putting the processes in place for next season, the season beyond that. And, and if you look at the whole history of United, they've had a massive financial advantage over most of English football since Old Trafford was opened in, I'm going to say 1908, but that might be a year out one way or the other. Yeah, I think it is 907, 1908, I think, was, was when it was opened. And so with those financial advantages, they should have been always able to, to if not dominate, at least be competitive in, in the top sort of five or six, even in the days before massive TV rights and the modern financial structures. And yet the history of the club is frequent frustration, not spending the money particularly wisely, not using those economic advantages, apart from under three visionary managers, under Magnell, under Busby, under Ferguson. They're the only three managers in the history of Manchester United to have won the league, which for a club that's won the league 20 times, it's the most successful club, is an amazing statistic. More managers have won the league with Sunderland than with Manchester United. <laughs> so but the key thing for, for, if you're the United board, United directors, what you have to put in place is a structure to make sure you don't have that inconsistency, that when your Messiah figure disappears, you're not just left scratching around for another messiah there's actually something to fall back on so i you know we, we've we've highlighted why um it's difficult for Ragnar to impose his his philosophy in the next six months partly because of personnel partly because of timings uh but i think we shouldn't get too hung up on that what's important is is, is what comes afterwards jonathan that was brilliant thanks a million for joining us cheers Cheers, thank you. That's Jonathan Wilson there. As we said at the start, the Football Writer of the Year, third time he's won it, and you can see why. Um, a strange kind of glory, as, as uh, Dunphy's book title said. It's <laughs> mad. I, did, I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't heard that said that way. Three managers, they're the only ones who won the league. Okay, three pretty good ones. But uh, it's mad. Yeah, and the Messiah doesn't... Well, I suppose Klopp is probably a messiah figure in Liverpool, but Liverpool also have the infrastructure behind them that that supports his his. You know, he's got he's got a he's got a, he's got a pretty robust twelve apostles. You know, he's but got he, he is the he is the messiah. And if if like I think Liverpool fans at the moment are celebrating every single win because when he goes, what happens next? Well, yeah, that's that's the challenge for every team, every club is to be sustainable beyond the manager. And Chelsea have probably managed that better than any club. I mean, I don't. You know they have the the, the millions and billions of, of Abramovich, but they've but also actually, got a structure and they've got this like loan system exactly. that they have, and they're they're functioning football. But they've found a way of making football Fifteen years ago, they decided that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and they always have massive strength and depth because they always have ten players who are playing Premier League football or European football for in one of the top five leagues that they can just they can get back or they can buy back if they want. Yeah. Um, I think City have a similar infrastructure behind I mean Guardiola's again a, a messianic manager figure and, and when he goes that will be very interesting what to do but they do also have they've built with their resources which are incredible uh, basically a football city in on the edge of Manchester and they've got a massive um, like they've got a network of clubs now you know like this, it's not just city they're a bit like Red Bull so that all feeds into being sustainable beyond uh, and again it does help when you are backed by a super state but yeah know, it's really interesting to see exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, if you've got thoughts on that, we'd love to hear them. You can get us on 087 180 180. You can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. Loads of comments coming in on that. We will get to them in just a moment. And a reminder, OTBAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razor.